Good morning. Welcome to church this morning. And I'm not going to stop you chatting. I would love you to just turn around and welcome each other to church this morning. We have maybe some visitors here this morning. So um, just, yeah, let's welcome each other to church this morning. Welcome to church this morning. It's just wonderful to be able to come together and worship God as a church family this morning. And if you are visiting with us, you're really, really welcome. A little bit later on in our service, we were going to be thinking about, not too long ago, Catherine's going to be helping us think about the 12 disciples and how they were called to be Jesus' closest friends. They were called into this close relationship and friendship with the Son of God. And that is really quite amazing that we can know Jesus as our friend. But what is also amazing is who Jesus is. And as we come to worship Jesus today, we want to remind ourselves of his kingship, of his reign. And I want to read some verses from Revelation um, chapter 15. Esther's just going to flick it to the front. There we go. Oh, f- oh, press the side. There we go. Brilliant. I want to read just some verses from Revelation 15 that speak of who Jesus is as we come to worship him this morning. I'm going to read these verses from Revelation 15. Then we're going to stand and sing, crown him with many crowns, just after I briefly pray. But let me read these verses. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. This is the Jesus that we come to worship today. Let me lead us briefly in prayer as we begin our service. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to worship you today, as we continue in our series of seeing Jesus, we pray, Father, that you would open our eyes to see more clearly who Jesus is, not only that we can know him as our friend and savior, but that he is king. And as we come to praise his name now, Father, may we lift his name high, acknowledge that he is king. May he be king of our lives as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing, crown him with many crowns.
to pray together as a church family. So maybe boys and girls, will we do the prayer drill? So hands out. I'm going to clap three times. One, two, three, and close our eyes and close our mouths. As amazingly, we talk to God. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your, the Bible that tells us who you are, that helps us to see Jesus more clearly. And Father, we thank you for those verses from Revelation that spoke of Jesus as King, as King of the nations. Father, may our praise today be right and true of the King that we come to worship. And Father, we thank you for those words that we have sung that have reminded us that Jesus is creator, that he is sustainer, that he is Lord. And Father, today, we want to thank you that we can know Jesus. That not only that we can know about Jesus as we open up the pages of the Bible and read the Gospels, but Father, that we can know him in our lives as he calls us to follow him. Father, today, help us to hear more, to know more, and to love Jesus more today. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Boys and girls, would you like to come up to the front? Because we have a little game to play to get us all wide awake and enthusiastic this morning. So come on up. It's great to see you. Oh, brilliant. There's Finlay. Thank you, Finlay, for coming up and leading the way. Great. Super duper. Great. We'll squeeze up and make sure there's room for everyone. Yes, I think. There's enough in here. What about if Finlay and Asher, would you two mind sitting in the next row? Is that okay? And we'll let these girls sit there. Great. How is everybody this morning? Good. Great. Now, hands up. Was anybody watching the rugby match last night? <gasps> yes, there's lots of people watching the rugby. Now, was anybody, instead of watching the rugby, were they watching Strictly come dancing? <gasps> there were lots of people watching Strictly. Well, I thought, because we've all had such a great and full weekend so far, that maybe, just maybe, you're feeling a wee bit sleepy this morning after all the excitement. Is anybody, was anybody hard to get out of bed this morning? Yes, thank you for being honest. Any grown-ups found it hard to get up this morning? Well, I thought, wouldn't it be super to start off by playing a game to see how wide awake we are? And you'll see on the screen that it's a game that we're actually going to play later in Kingdom Kids called Follow the Leader. And because we're going to play it later in Kingdom Kids too, we'll save all the hard bits till then. And we'll be nice and gentle so that everybody can play. So the game Follow the Leader is that you have to copy everything that the leader does. You have to do and try to do everything that the leader does. And for this turn, I'm going to be the leader, but in Kingdom Kids, you can all have a go. So, and I'm going to invite everybody to do it. So the first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to clap your hands. Can you clap your hands? Great. And the next thing is to pat your head. Let's see everybody following the leader, patting your head. And the next thing is to stump your feet. Great, following the leader there. And the next thing is to rub your tummy. Well done. And the next thing is, can you rub your tummy and pat your head at the same time? That's a wee bit trickier, isn't it? Well done, you can stop. Can Super dipper. We're going to have more fun later, doing even some harder things of following the leader in Kingdom Kids. But our Bible story this morning is all about some people who followed their leader. They did their best to do everything that their leader did. And the leader that we're talking about in the story, can anybody guess who they think that might be? Yes, Ethan. That's Jesus. And Jesus had some special friends who followed him. Now, can anybody guess what Jesus' special friends might have been called? And there's a big clue up here. Yes, Sarah. Jesus had 12 disciples. And you know what? Nowadays, there's millions of disciples all over the world who do what Jesus does and who tell people about God's good news. But Jesus started off with just 12. 
And our Bible story this morning, we're going to learn about these first 12 disciples. But I need your help. I'm going to hold up a sign. What does that sign say? Finley, what's it say? Hey. Say it even louder. Hey. hey! It says, hey. Well, whenever I hold up hey, I would love for you to go, when I hold it up, for you to go, hey, come follow me. Do you think you could give that a go? We'll practice. You do that action. Hey, come follow me. We'll try it. I'll invite everybody to do it. We'll give it a go. Hey, hey come follow me. me. Well done, well done. This is going to be good. So our Bible story this morning is taken from Mark chapter 3. And it's taken from all the different four different Gospels. And it starts off by saying that when Jesus began his ministry on earth, he did amazing things. He healed many people. He befriended the lonely. And he told everybody that he met about God's great big love for them and how they could become a friend of God. Now, Jesus called people to be his special friends, to be his disciples. And we're going to learn more about them. So Jesus walked along the banks of the Sea of Galilee and he saw two fishermen standing on the shore and they were called Peter and Andrew. And Jesus said, hey, come follow me. And you know what? Immediately they did. They dropped their fishing nets and they followed Jesus. So we're going to put Peter there and we're going to put Andrew there. Maybe as we go along, you'll think, oh, there's people in our church called Peter and there's people in our church called Andrew. So they dropped everything and they followed Jesus. Now next, Peter and Andrew and Jesus, they kept walking along the shore. And they could see out in the distance a little small fishing boat with two brothers and their dad in it. The men were getting their nets ready for a whole day of fishing. And the brothers were called James and John. Maybe you know people called James and John. And Jesus said to James and John, Hey, come follow me. And you know what James and John did? They got out of the boat and they did. They immediately followed Jesus. Do you know what? They left their boat behind. They left their nets behind. And they left their dad behind. Because they were so excited to follow Jesus. Next, Jesus was on his way to Galilee. And he met Philip and his friend Bartholomew. And Jesus said to these two guys, Hey, come follow me. And what do you think they did? What do you think Philip and Bartholomew did? Did they accept Jesus' invitation? Yeah. Yes, they went with him. So we'll add these to the board of Jesus' special friends. Great, so they left everything to follow Jesus. Next, meet Peter. <laughs> Next, Jesus met Thomas and Matthew. No, Matthew, people didn't think Matthew was too nice of a guy because he was a tax collector. He collected money for the government and would take some of the money for himself. What do you think Jesus said to Matthew and Thomas? He said, hey, come follow me. And what did they do? They did. So we'll add Matthew and we'll add Thomas. There we go. So our board of disciples is adding up. Next, Peter met a guy called James. And what did he, Jesus met a guy called James. And what did Jesus say? Hey, hey come follow me. And this guy, he had a bit of a funny nickname. He was called James the Younger. Imagine, it must have meant that he was the youngest of the bunch. And he followed Jesus. And next, Jesus met two more guys called Simon and Thaddeus. Simon was a freedom fighter, which meant that he liked to get into fights with people against the government. Well, Jesus still said to him, Hey, come follow me. And what did they do? They did follow him, so we'll add them in there. And last but not least, Jesus met Judas Iscariot. And Jesus knew that one day Judas was going to betray him and hand him over to a group of people who didn't like him. But Jesus knew that it was all part of God's big plan. And Jesus said to Judas, 
Hey, come follow me. And what did he do? He did, didn't he? How many disciples do we have on our board? Will we count them together? Yes, let's hear you count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Jesus started off with twelve special followers called his disciples. And they were an interesting bunch because they were all different, weren't they? Some of them were fishermen, some of them were tax collectors, some of them liked to get into fights, some of them were young, some of them were old. But Jesus really wanted them to be his special friends. And over the next three years of Jesus' ministry on earth, these guys walked with Jesus, they journeyed all over with him, and they learnt from him all about God. And Jesus went on to give them a very special job. He then sent them out on their own to go and tell the rest of the whole world all about God and how everyone can be a friend of God. Amazing. And today, Jesus is still saying something to us. Jesus is saying, hey, come follow me to all of us. Because he started off with 12 but Jesus invites all of us to be his followers so that we can learn more from him in the Bible and go out and tell people all about his amazing love for them. And it doesn't matter if we're a boy or a girl, if we're young or if we're old, or if we all like different things, Jesus still invites us to, hey, come follow me. Well done for listening to that story. I'm glad we didn't get too mixed up with all the different names of the disciples. We're going to stand and sing a song. And I love this song because one of the verses in it says, hey, come follow me. And it's talking about Jesus calling the first disciples. And the song is Jesus is the King. And just to remind you of the actions, it goes, Jesus is the King, ruler of everything, Jesus is the one, promised one, the Son of God. Jesus is the Lord. He's the one. You can't ignore Jesus. Jesus is the King. Okay, we'll we give it a go. Yes. And do you know what? Does anybody like to come up and help me do the actions? Oh, Finley, yes. Does that mean Asher's going to come up too? Tilly, you're going to come up? Great. Anybody else can join in too. So we're all going to stand. And we'll all try and do the actions together. Okay, boys and girls, you stand up. Great. Thank you. 
Super. Just a few announcements at this time in our service. Firstly, thank you. Thank you to, to many people who were part of our, our Harvest Weekend last weekend. Um, a big thank you to you if you contributed in any way to that over the weekend. Also on Monday morning, we had a great band of workers on Monday morning. So thank you to that. Also thank you to those people. There are a number of people who responded to our request um, to be help out in, in seedlings. So thank you if you did that. We're still um, looking for some further help. But if you, thank you to those people who did respond to that. Just a couple of other uh, announcements. PW is taking place this Tuesday evening, 7.30 in Kilcoan. All ladies are, are welcome. There, there's no obligation to go along to every PW meeting. You can just pop in to one that suits you or takes your, your fancy. And if you would like to come along this Tuesday, you, you might want to bring some red, orange, or something that is red, orange, or yellow along for the autumn stall um, or even buy a treat to take home. So obviously they're, they're having an autumn stall. You can bring something red, orange, or yellow and, and even buy something to take home with you on Tuesday night. Libby Russell, who is Mark Russell, the minister of Ballycarry, is Mark's wife. Libby's coming along and speaking about the theme for the year, which is being transformed. And as I said, all ladies are really welcome to go along to that. It's just a reminder, the Kirk session we're meeting on Thursday evening, 7.30 in London Hall. And then just a further invitation um, before, that's next Sunday, but just this evening, that's tonight at 7 o'clock, is the harvest at Almagy Methodist Church. Um, each harvest, we always invite each other to our services. Tonight is Almagy Methodist Harvest, 7 o'clock in Almagy Methodist Church, and the, the worship will be led by Whitehead Ladies Choir um, and of all of them. You'll see an invitation to our service next Sunday. It's our All Age, monthly All Age service. It's also our GB and BB enrollment, um, and our theme is, is Anchored. You'd be really welcome to join us next Sunday morning for our All Age service. And then finally, in a couple of weeks' time, we are having a, a light party, a messy church. Usually about three times in the year, we have messy church, Halloween, Christmas, Easter. Messy church is an opportunity for us as a church family to invite families in our local community to come along, um, to engage with church in a really relaxed and fun way. And so we're having a, a light party um, on Sunday, the 22nd of October. But as we move forward with Messy Church, I'd really love you as our church family to see this as a great opportunity for us as a church family to welcome in our local community. And so our Messy Church isn't just for those people who come and join us for our local community or families in our church family. It is for us all to come and be a part of that to welcome people who come from our community, to get to know them, to chat with them, to get um, involved in our messy church. So I'd really love you, no matter who you are this morning, to consider coming along. There's a role to play, and even we are really looking for people who'll just come and chat. And I know there are people in our church family who might be good at chatting. And I'd love you to come and welcome people from our community and chat to them. So that's our light party. Two weeks from today, you'll be really welcome to be a part of that. Invitation to everybody to stay behind, um, spend time in fellowship, get to know each other, and, and enjoy some refreshments after our service. Today, I'm beginning something we, we tried a number of years ago, quite a long time ago, a little slot once a month, called This Time Tomorrow. Um, this is an opportunity for us to do a number of things as a church family, to get to know some members of our church family, and to discover 
if we didn't know already, that God cares about every part of our lives, not just what happens in church. And so we're going to interview one person each month from a different maybe area of, of work, the workplace, to encourage them, to pray for them, and to be reminded that God cares about what we do from Monday to Friday. And this morning, Jane has very kindly agreed um, to let me ask her a couple of questions. Jane's going to come up. And, and this morning, I suppose our area of, of, of the workplace is, is health care. We have a number of our congregation. You stand this side beside the mic there, Jane. We have a number of our church family involved in healthcare in a number of different ways. And so I, I picked on Jane um, to find out a little bit more about what Jane does. And then Roberta's going to come and pray for those people in our church family who are involved in healthcare in many different different ways. Jane, thank you. No problem, Peter. For agreeing. I for thought ag I couldn't say no. Couldn't no. That's an interesting. <laughs> yeah. now I'm going to get you to stand in front of the mic, Jane, yeah, so that everybody no can 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 hear you speak. And maybe other people could could feel that when I ask them, they they just can't say no. <laughs> but um, but thank you. And it's just four little simple questions to find out a little bit more about Jane, but also how we might pray for Jane and others who are involved in, in healthcare. Jane, where will you be this time tomorrow? So this time tomorrow I'll be working as a doctor and um, I'll be doing a, a clinic um, in Carrick Fergus, a paediatric clinic. Brilliant. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about what you do in um, your role as a paediatric doctor? So um, I work as a, a paediatrician and I'm employed within the Northern Trust and um, my job is a wee bit of a, a mix. I do some community paediatrics which is quite local to here, and then I do um, hospital paediatrics as well, Antrim Hospital, um, and there I work on the ward, and I do some paediatric diabetes care as well. So um, my community work would be more with children where there are um, maybe concerns about development, and um, quite often maybe children where there are concerns maybe about autism, and that's more kind of clinic work, and then hospital work is probably fairly self-explanatory so um yeah so quite a quite a mixture of things each week yeah, <laughs> so brilliant brilliant now what are some of your challenges and what are some of your joys okay so um i suppose challenges um i working with children is great but it can be quite emotional as well and obviously it can be quite you know stressful for families if their their child is unwell um and Sometimes, you know, you're having to break bad news or, um, you know, that can be difficult. I think particularly as I've become a mum, it kind of gives you a bit more appreciation of what families are going through. Um, but, yeah, that's, it's kind of sometimes it can make it a wee bit more emotional as well. Kind of because you're maybe thinking, oh, if I was in this situation, but you can't, you kind of have to, I suppose, have that barrier as well. Um, it's just hard at the minute, I think, just within the NHS, the waiting lists are quite long and we're quite short-staffed at the minute. And, um, yeah, I suppose personally, just for me, sometimes it can be a challenge just juggling um, kind of home life and work life. But thankfully, I just work part-time, which is great. So I kind of feel I have the, the best of both worlds. Sometimes it's nice getting out to work and just having a change of scene as well. So, um, yeah. So, but and, and so just uh, any joys other than leaving the family behind, Jane? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and any joys oh, of your work? Well, I do really enjoy my work the majority of the time and it's really interesting. I feel, you know, can quite often make a big difference and um, sometimes you see quite an immediate difference. Maybe when I'm working in the hospital, a child's maybe unwell and within a few hours they're looking much better and chatty and that's great. Sometimes it can take a wee bit longer maybe in the community work to see a difference. Um, and it can be a lot of fun. I get to play a lot with children as part of my suppose, developmental assessment. You're down on the floor and you play with toys and that's really nice. And, you know, I really love meeting the kids and meeting the families and I feel it's a real privilege, you know, you get to see get a real insight into other, other people's lives. Um, and I've lots of really lovely colleagues. And I think that you're working quite closely with people, you form really close relationships. And 
I've made some really good friends over the years. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of positive things as well. Yeah, no, no super. Finally, Jane, as a church family, you want to, to pray for you, but others within our, our church family who are involved in, in health care this morning, and Roberta's just about to come and do that. How, how, how can we pray for you and others in our church family this morning? Um, so just to pray for those working in the NHS, it's, it's difficult at the minute for people, and um, there's a lot of you know pressures and cutbacks, and just those particularly coming into the winter time, just to pray for staff you know to keep them well and give them strength and um helping them to you know make good decisions and you know to I suppose always trying to keep the patient at the center of what's going on and always wanting to do the best for who you're looking after and just pray for those in management and helping them to make decisions about funding and where money should go and just to be good good leaders and I suppose just the difficulty for us in Northern Ireland, it's just with the way the government is and just I suppose just to pray for you know, political leaders to come together and just to try and, and to, to help with that side of things too. So, yeah, so. Brilliant. <laughs> I, I think Jane deserves a little round of applause. Thank you, Jane, you took a seat. <laughs> Roberta's gonna come. Roberta's gonna come and, and pray but also she's going to, to read our, our reading this morning as well. Thanks, Roberta. Let us pray. Father God, we pray for those who work in health care. We pray for those who work in hospitals, in GP surgeries, our ambulance workers, pharmacists, doctors, nurses, administrators, mental health workers, care workers, social workers, and many more who serve our society. We pray for them now. Father, we, especially, we are especially mindful of those within our church family who, like Jane, work in health care. We ask you, God, to provide them with wisdom as they serve you and their communities with this service. May they always treat their patients with respect and dignity, always remembering the call to love our neighbours as ourselves. May you give them discernment and clarity when they are diagnosing and treating their patients. May the love that you have shown these healthcare workers be reflected in, their, in them to their patients. We pray God that you would sustain them through the secondary trauma that can come with seeing others suffer and carrying those burdens. We pray that they would feel supported and cared for as they process this grief. Provide them with peace and space to care for themselves in order to maintain a healthy frame of mind to care for others. Help our healthcare workers be transformative agents within our society. May they bring healing to their patients and reflect the love of Christ to those entrusted in their care. In Jesus' name, amen. The reading this morning can be found on page 1004 if anyone wants to read along. Uh, Mark, chapter Mark chapter three, verse seven, page 104. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a, a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. But he gave them strict instructions, strict orders, not to tell who he was. Jesus went up on the mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve designating them apostles, 
that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. These are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. To them he gave the name Boenerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Amen. Thank you, Roberta. We're going to stand and sing um, before we return to those verses. We're going to stand and sing Beneath the Cross of Jesus. like to take your pew bibles again to turn back to mark three that would be brilliant we're going to look at these more the last section that roberta read from verse 13 the appointing of the 12 apostles it was it was the turn of the men across our three local churches last night to have the opportunity to meet together as part of our common ground events. We had a, a good evening and even better that it involved a good win for Ireland against Scotland. And last night, the 15 players that Ireland had on the pitch at any one time were just too good for the Scots. And particularly in the first half, Ireland were too powerful, too clinical, and the scoreline told that story. And usually, in any team sport, whether it's the Rugby World Cup, whether it's the Cricket World Cup that's currently taking place in India, or even the Ryder Cup last weekend, it's usually the players that make the difference. 
It's those who are in the midst of the action that make the difference in whether a team wins or loses. But occasionally, maybe when two teams are very evenly matched, it's not the players who make the ultimate difference between losing or winning. It's the coach who makes the difference in the game. And in some situations, a team will win even in spite of its players because of the coach making the difference. And as we turn to these verses in Mark 3 and we hear of Jesus calling out his 12 disciples, and as they begin this amazing journey together, we begin to see that emphatically it is not the players, it is not the disciples who make the difference in the game. These verses speak of the beginning of something that has transformed lives, transformed communities, societies, and nations over the last 2,000 years. These 12 disciples were the nucleus of God's new chosen people, the church. And that number 12 clearly points to the 12 tribes of Israel. And this new beginning marks out God's people, not by their connection with Israel, but by their connection to Jesus. And in very worldly terms, if some business leader was choosing a team who were going to be pivotal in the creation of an organization that would spread across the world and last for thousands of years, they wouldn't have chosen these 12 men. The list begins with Peter, who would deny Jesus. It finishes with Judas, who betrayed him. And in the middle, we find Thomas, who doubted him. And that's not a great start. And if you're looking for a a good working relationship in the team, you probably wouldn't have chosen Matthew, the tax collector, who worked for the Romans and was therefore regarded as a traitor by the Jews. You wouldn't put him, Matthew, together with Simon the Zealot, a Jewish extremist seeking to overthrow the Jew, the Romans. This was a diverse group of people, different passions, different backgrounds, different agendas, imperfect in so many ways. You couldn't find a group of 12 more different and imperfect people. And yet, the church of Jesus Christ was built upon this group of disciples. The closing verses of Ephesians 2 perfectly describes the church and reminds us afresh of who makes the difference in the church. From the very beginning until today and forevermore, it is Jesus who makes the difference. Up on the screen, hopefully you can can see, but Ephesians 2 at the end says, Consequently, you, those who are hearing this, we as a church, you are no longer foreigners and strangers but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Built on the foundation of the apostles with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. This mismatch of disciples find a unity together, not in their interests or their hobbies, not in their political views or common workplaces. It's not their backgrounds or their upbringing. Their unity is found in the one who called them to be his disciples, the one who committed himself to invest in their lives, the one who used them to change the world. And the church around the world, our church family here in the pews around you, we are no different. Our true identity is God's people. It's not found in our national identity, our education, our status, our political beliefs, our upbringing, our hobbies, our interests, our unity. What binds us together, what helps us to overcome challenges and disagreements, what helps us see how we might move forward together, what helps us see what is of most importance, the very essence of who we are as a church family is found in the one who has called us to be his disciples, the one who has died for us, the one who has committed himself 
to us to change us, the one who sends us out to change the world. The cornerstone of our church family, the one who makes the difference is Jesus. And so if you're a, a Christian this morning, if you're a follower of Jesus today, it is Jesus who has called you. The, the origin of our relationship with God is firstly, I think as I referred to a number of weeks ago, a movement of God towards us, a desire on God's behalf because of his amazing love to say, come, follow me. We could do the actions from the kids' address, but I'll not make you. Hey, come, follow me. That invitation from Jesus, the one who came into this world, sent from his Father because of his amazing love for you and I, the one who came to die to pay the punishment for our sin and rebellion, the one who says to each of us to come. Come in faith and repentance to trust him, to follow him, to know him as your Lord and Savior and friend. And that invitation to come has echoed down through the centuries. It's been shared again and again so that millions and millions of people today right across the world are followers, are disciples of Jesus. And I wonder today for you, might you be hearing that invitation to come? And if you are hearing that invitation to come, don't, don't ignore it respond, come to Jesus. And if you want to speak to me about that further, I'd love to chat to you about it. Because this is of the greatest importance. Our lives are at stake. This changes our lives forever. And there's just a great significance in the truth that it is Jesus who calls us. It's Jesus who initiates our walk with him. We, of course, have to respond to that call. But that call from Christ means that we can know a great security, a great assurance in our relationship with God. Our salvation does not rest on what we have done in the past or how we feel in the present. It's not dependent on what you or I do or what we don't do. Our relationship with Jesus is dependent on Jesus' call to you, to our lives, his movement towards us, his rescue and salvation. I think that's so encouraging. And it's encouraging to think of words from Isaiah 43, where we hear God's heart for his people, that we are precious to him, that we are honored in his sight, that he loves us, that he is with us, that he is the one who created us. He is the one who has formed us, his people, the church. He has summoned us by name. We are his. After months, years of planning and campaigning, after a hard-fought election and eventual success, I wonder what it's like to be the Prime Minister of the UK or the President of the United States, who on their first morning sit down at their big desk in their comfortable seat and think, right, what do I do now? What do I do now? Now, I'm pretty sure that that would never be the case. There are at least many, many people who would be telling them what they need to do and they've been thinking about what they're going to be doing. But for, I think for many of us, we'd sit down and go, what on earth do we do now? And maybe at different times in our lives, we can reach that point in our lives. We can pause and think, what, what can I do? What do I do now? What is next? And in Mark 3, Jesus calls his disciples to himself. And then we hear from Mark, what is next? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? What do we do next after responding to that call to follow? And Mark wants to, us to, to leave today remembering a couple of things of what it means to follow Jesus. 
And firstly, we want to think about being called to connect. The first thing that we want to do is to be with Jesus, that we have been called to be with Jesus. Returning to the kind of the presidency of the United States in the last couple of years, I came across a photographer called Peter Souza, and he has been the, the formal um, White House photographer for two presidents, for Ronald Reagan and for Barack um, Obama. And, and looking at his photographs, it seems that he was one of very few people who had the opportunity and experience of being with Barack Obama day in, day out. For many, most public of occasions, but also for very many intimate and private occasions. And there are so many photographs, you can look them up on the internet, that, that document what seems to have been such a really close relationship that Barack Obama had with his photographer. And after Pete Sousa's, um, Peter Sousa's role in the White House finished, his first book of fo fo photographs that was published is called An Intimate Portrait. In Mark 3, verse 14, we read this. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. The very first thing that these 12 disciples were to do was to be with Jesus. To live life with him for what turned out to be three years of itinerant ministry, traveling around, observing Jesus as he healed the sick, as he preached about the kingdom of God, as he ate meals with people, as he performed amazing miracles, as he showed compassion to those in need, as he taught in parables, as he took himself away off to have time with his father in prayer, to see Jesus being betrayed, arrested, crucified on a cross, the first disciples were to be with Jesus, to get to know God in the most intimate of ways, seeing God's perfect character lived out in the person of his son, hearing God's wisdom from the lips of Jesus, witnessing God's power right before their eyes. It was this time with Jesus that shaped and strengthened their faith. It was through this most precious of time that their personal relationship and friendship with Jesus grew. It was this time that prepared them for what lay ahead. And in being called by Jesus, we're firstly called to be with Jesus, to be in relationship with him. And as we so naturally do in our relationships with others, when we want a relationship to grow and to strengthen, we invest in it. We spend time with those people. And I wonder if so often we don't have the same view about a relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's harder because Jesus isn't physically with us. Jesus isn't right in front of us in a physical way to engage with. But it's truly amazing that we have been called into this relationship with Jesus. Maybe this morning we might just grasp afresh what this means to see just a new, just the vital importance of being with Jesus. That we're not firstly called to do but we have been called to be with him. To pause regularly to get to know Jesus through the Bible. To pause regularly to talk to him as we would anyone that we want to get to know better. That firstly, we have been called to be with Jesus. And there are some relationships that we foster in our lives over, over time that make a significant difference to us we have a growing and a maturing relationship with Jesus, that can only make a difference in your life. I wonder, can I encourage you to take the opportunity, the, this privilege of knowing Jesus, to take that seriously in our lives today? So we've been called, and we've been called to connect with Jesus. And secondly, we've been called and commissioned over this last week, I've actually had a couple of conversations with those who employ apprentices. And apprentices are usually learning a practical trade. They may spend a couple of days at college or tech, and then they're out working, learning on the job for the rest of the week. And that learning on the job is so vital. 
They're watching. They're observing. And as they then try and sometimes get it wrong, they're learning. They're getting better at what they do. They're learning from someone else, picking up the tips of the tree. They're then putting it into practice. And as the 12 disciples are called initially to be with Jesus, they're then commissioned to go, to put it into practice. So all that they have seen Jesus do, they were then sent out to preach the good news of the kingdom, to push back against the ruler of the darkness of this world. They were to do what they had watched Jesus do before their very eyes. They were to follow in Jesus' footsteps as they began to establish under Christ the church. Now, we are not the 12 disciples. They had a really unique role, a unique opportunity and privilege to live with Jesus and to be those upon which the church was built as those vital eyewitnesses. However, as we open up the Bible, as we read the New Testament, the picture of what our calling to go is to look like is painted again and again. I think, well, over these coming weeks, as we journey through the Gospels, as we see Jesus, we're going to see more specifically what that might look like in these coming weeks, what it looks like to go. But it is, at the very least, a mindset that sees ourselves being sent out, of going out in the name of Jesus, going out into our homes, our workplaces, our social circles, to our streets, our communities, going out and being like Jesus. Being like the one who has called us to himself. And the verse I want to leave with you today, it's found in, in um, <clears throat> 1 John 2. And it perfectly picks up the themes that we've already been thinking about today of being called to be with Jesus. And it says this, whoever says he abides in Jesus ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. Whoever says he abides in Jesus, whoever is with Jesus ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. And so in our calling to be with Jesus, to abide in him, we are commissioned to go to walk in the same way that Jesus walked, to demonstrate God's love, his grace, his forgiveness, his compassion in our words and our actions, to speak of God's love for those who are far from him, to speak of God's kingdom, a kingdom with Jesus as king and a king who died to save. And so today, as disciples, as followers of Jesus, as those who have been called by Jesus, we ought to walk in the same way in which Jesus walked. So I'm going to pray for us in this coming week that we might indeed walk as Jesus walked. I'm also going to use some other prayers maybe that might resonate with you today. Maybe you're someone who's searching for truth today or you just need belief in Christ. Maybe the prayers that I might pray might resonate with you today. Maybe you can, can pray along with me. But let's pray together. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for Jesus. We want to thank you for the, the call, the invitation that he issues to us to follow him. And maybe today, this morning, we are someone who's searching for truth. Lord Jesus, you claim to be the way, the truth, and the life. Grant that I might be undaunted by the cost of following you as I consider the reasons for doing so. And if what you claim is true, please guide me, teach me, and open me to the reality of who you are. Give me an understanding of you that is coherent, convincing, that leads to the life you promise. Father, maybe this morning that is our prayer, that search for truth. Father, if it is, Father, help us to hear that invitation to come to you. And Father, maybe this morning we need a belief 
in you. Maybe this is our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, I admit that I am weaker, more sinful than I ever dared admit. But through you, I am more loved and accepted than I ever dared hope. I thank you for paying my debt on the cross, taking what I deserved in order to offer me complete forgiveness. Knowing that you have been raised from the dead, I turn from my sins and receive you as my Lord and Savior. Father, maybe this morning that might be our prayer. But Father, our prayer this morning is, for many of us also, is that you might go with us. That you might go with us into this week ahead in our workplaces. When we spend time with our friends, when we are out and about when we're playing sport or um, in our hobbies, attending organizations or groups or spending time in our homes. Father, that you might go with us, that through your Spirit that you might enable us to walk as Jesus walked. Father, may this week, may we also take seriously that call to, to be with you to spend time with you, to get to know Jesus more so that we might walk as he walked, that we might know his peace, his love, his grace speaking into our lives. Father, we want to thank you that you're a God who is the creator and king of this world, but a God who loves us and he wants to be with us. Father, may we leave this morning with that great assurance and truth on our hearts and our minds. And Father, we know and take great confidence that you go with us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand, sing, and close our service with Hear the Call of the Kingdom. being with us this morning. If you can stay for refreshments, please do. But let me pray for us as we part today and close our service. Let me pray. Father, as we part, may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd from the sheep, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.